a great meeting point, convenient light meals, hot and cold beverages, or a quick snack on the go. What's your order for the day? We don't just say, we do. It's the Stain City Way. Hello and welcome to Real Talk with me, Anelim Dodda, right here on SABC3. Today, the stage is for a creative genius whose roaring success story is one that will, without a doubt, outlive him as generations of children will grow up to his music, mostly because of a community of animals living it out in the Pride Lands. He was recommended to Disney by the prolific film score composer Hans Zimmer to work with him and this body of work earned them a Grammy Award, as well as an Oscar and a Golden Globe. That became the highest grossing animated film film in cinematic history. To date, over 8,000 performances of The Lion King have been seen on Broadway's theater circuit with a premium ticket costing 190 US dollars. Celebrating its 20th anniversary, The Lion King tour is scheduled to take place in more than 40 cities around the world and we'll have to wait a tad bit longer for the star-studded movie remake which will hit cinemas in July 2019. The man behind the voice and the spirit of, Le of Lion King, Lebu M, created this. Ah! Mr. Lebu Hang Murake, better known as Lebu Oem, is ending the stage today. Lebu, please welcome to the show. I called you by Lebu M. Lebu M. It's not a tongue twister. Lebu Hang. Is it Lebu Hang or Lebu Hang? Born Lebu Hang, went to exile, and the exile was in Lesotho. When I got my passport, it was Lebu Hang. Lebu Hang. Yeah, now it's permanently Lebu Hang because I don't want to have to go to the passport office and go back to Lebu Hang. It's a queue. It's a very long queue. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to go. Between there. you, I, I know you don't have the yeah. time for those queues. Yeah. But now, here's the thing when you hear that, 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 mm. that's you, right? That's me. Yeah. That is you. So yeah. when you hear that, in Jay, randomly, because lots of people use it in many situations, be it a skit, people use it on late night shows. Mm. It's, I mean, when Barack Obama uh, gave his speech at the White House conference and yeah. Donald yeah. Trump yeah. wanted was his. He was toasting he, Trump. He, yeah. Yes, and he was yeah. toasting Trump. Yeah. They played it there as well. Yeah. Do you like reach over and you pat yourself in your back? You're like, yeah, man, keep awesome. <laughs> I didn't expect that one. <laughs> Maybe two, three weeks after the movie came out, a year or so, you're conscious of it. But the movie came out, what, about 23, 25 years ago? Yeah. And then the Broadway show, which I worked on as composer and producer, and I was in the cast. Mm. So you never have time to ser seriously reflect on that because one is always working. The first time I really felt the impact of what that opening of the Lion King is mm. was when we started doing the uh, now most successful composer tour in history, the Hans Zimmer tour. Mm. When we opened, we did the first tour last year mm. and we opened at Wembley Stadium. And <clears throat> I kind of was, you know, I'm used to performing. I'm a performer now before anything. I like to sing, mm. uh, but I haven't done that for a long time. So I'm the guest of the tour, and mm -hmm. so I come into the show maybe 25 minutes after his set starts. So it's like Hans Zimmer profiling all the music that he's done, yeah. much like Dave Foster did. Yeah, in, including uh, a, 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 a combination of my work with him. Okay. Yeah, so okay. obviously, the and I'm the only act that's not announced. You know, you got Gladiator, you got all these six mm. sequences that come before me. And then I go, nah, and the whole place falls <laughs> apart. I know. You know. So I think in the last two years, uh, I've really started getting inside the significance and the global and iconic power yeah. of that work. Uh, and then this year, we, the tour doubled. We went back to the cities we went to in Europe, mm. uh, touched up here and there in, in the Scandinavian countries. Mm. But this is the big the longest i've ever been on anything we've been on the world tour for five months Jeepers. doing the same thing nah, it was, nah, <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm like going to my hotel and trying to say nah, 
Yeah. Do you know, it, it, it yeah. can be on a big stage, but even when like normal people yeah. give birth, how you <laughs> announce your child? No, <laughs> how you announce your child is no. I've heard them all. Never heard that one before. I promise you. Serious. You stand on the balcony, people yeah. come, and then you go now, Simba, guys. Are you saying you 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 creating that or that has happened? That before? has happened. <laughs> nah, that's <Thank> cool. <laughs> right? That's cool. I never heard that before. But I've now, heard them all. Not that one. But now. Obviously, that would be your most known work, right? Yes. Um, when you think about it, you're like, ah, guys, you know, this is my no most known work, the most, you know, profitable one. But this actually is my favorite piece of work. Could it be Congo? Could it be Tears of the Sun? Could it be Power of One? Which yeah. one is like, means the most to you by yourself in a quiet corner? Power of One. Power of One, yeah. Yeah. I also thought so, because yeah. that was like your, yeah. your, your first introduction into like the big time. It's my first movie with Hans. And uh, as a first movie, we will always talk about it this way. Power of One was like a rehearsal for, for Lion King. Ah. So we finished the thoughts and the ideas and the whole idea of compiling and rather combining uh, African sound, African rhythms, mm. voices like a European with a Eurocentric orchestral yeah. thing. We, you know, Power of One is very special to us mm -hmm. because actually I, I got that job by default. It was never my thing that I'm going to end up doing soundtracks. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a demo. <clears throat> and then um, when we did Lion King, we, we had done Power of One, maybe two or three other movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then one or two of those would have been another movie I'd done with Hans. I think it was Dinosaur that came after Power of One. Mm -hmm. Then a couple of years later, it was Lion King. So we had a formula. But Leon and Lion King, when I was now in South Africa, yes. it was the, the time when the Why new dispensation come was come. No, it was the time. Um, I came back home, I left in 1979 to go to exile, I was 16 years old. I came back very first time, I believe 1991. And in 1992, we start working Lion King. Mm. So I'm um, between two countries and be becoming part of the new South Africa that has to mm. evolve. So when, when they looked for me, but at that time, a cell phone was not a reality, you know. Landline them. <laughs> yeah. So, I was actually in the hood, Ezola, hanging out. <laughs> what am I, Jim Boss? No, no just, just, just getting reoriented, you know? And then I got a message and went to LA, did a demo. Mm. Uh, what you hear in what ended up in the movie yeah. is a second take of what was a demo. So you guys were just, because I know I heard you guys recorded so much music for Lion King 1 that it, it actually ended up being used for, you know, the sequel. We ended up, uh, before, what happened is, uh, me and Hans wrote a lot of music of the soundtrack, because Elton and Tim were, were hired to write the five songs, ah. right, which we arranged, and I ended up changing yeah, that. I like yeah. that, Elton, it's not uh, Elton John. It's, oh, Elton John. It's El no, Kalo and Tim Rice. Kalo is your friend, so yeah. value, you can say Elton. We yeah. must say Elton John. But I need big guys. We need big guys. It's like when I say, you know, you know uh, Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Elton and yeah. Tim. So we, we, we rearranged all the music and co wrote the all entire orchestral stuff, uh, what is not known as the soundtrack. Yeah. But for the most part, I did that first part and came home as a demo. Uh. And then went back then to get hired to be vocal arranger for the entire okay. score, which then sets the pace for us finishing what we started with uh, the first two movies that I do with Hans. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now what happens is now, you, you know, when you, because of how it happened organically, yeah. when I came to do the demo, I, I wrote first the, the, the choral arrangement, yeah. you know, started doing that. Then they telling, you know, the director is there, uh, Rob Minkoff and they're basically like just telling me the beginning segment, which was going to have a dialogue. Or oh, when, when, when Rafiki <clears throat> comes up with Yeah, Simba. that entire segment yeah. originally was supposed to have a dialogue until I came in and rearranged the vocals and rearranged a bit of the percussions and all of that. So right before Nghamba, so they're telling me a story and Hans like, do something, you know, do, mm. do something African, you yeah. know. So I went, Based on all that African flavor. Yeah, you know, so we felt very good about the vocal arrangements. We felt very good about the entire segment before the, from the day we arrive on the planet. Mm. But it felt like something was missing. So because I had a sense, didn't have the whole script mm. of the entire movie, I came in, we set up the vocal booth, and I went, that's how it came up as a demo. Did that two or three takes and left, came back, and that changed the entire process of how the movie was going to evolve. Mm. 
so when they played for you, because I mean, you mm. do it, you leave and you come back, and then, yeah. then you come back and they press play, and you realize that you're basically the first thing. Yeah, I had, once I landed in South Africa, I forgot about, about <laughs> that. About three, four months later, I got called in, and the person that was uh, hired to originally be the arranger, yeah. uh, a deal was done. Got to us, in course. Uh, so I went back and finished the movie, and the, the rest is history, basically. And the rest is history. Listen, stay with us. After the break, Lebu M tells us about where and how his illustrious career then really took off. You want to hear this? From a very young age, Lebu surrounded himself with musical greats, which saw him being the youngest backup vocalist to perform in a nightclub in his youth. And this was the beginning of his journey to musical success. What are they called? The Pelican Bruce? <laughs> no. In the 70s. <laughs> the Pelican. The Pelican. The, the Pelican. Pelican. Club oh. Pelican, more specifically. Club uh -huh. Pelican. In the 70s in Soweto in Orlando, by Orlando Stadium, there was this institution uh, where the best musicians in the country uh -huh. had to play, whether from Cape Town and all. And I ended up there at age 14. Uh, I don't know, it's been Latege Gupi. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Gadi Khole was the DJ there. Uh, the late uh, Dick Koza uh, was the manager and Papa Mukwena was the, the band leader. Uh -huh. So someone had missed rehearsal. So I was humming something, bring my hot money basically. Okay, because I'm, I'm about to say, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, bring my hot was a lady who uh. was one of the singers. So they had three people that sang. This one time, the third guy was Thank not you. there. So I was humming a third part harmony, mm. just sitting by the couch, and oh, oh, but I babe said, what's that I'm fun? What's that? What's that? Wow. You know, what's that? And I'm like, then I stood there, and I started singing the third harmony part. And by default, I ended up being a background singer of the Pelican Band at age 14. And I mean, you know, apparently this club, you backed people up like the likes of Bomara Low. Bomara Ben Sech Masinga, Spirits Rejoice, Joy, uh. Uh, all the great bands, because that was the band era, you know, they were like real killer musicians, real mm. bands. And I was a member of the Pelican Band from then until I, I went to exile. So when does the U.S. ambassador see you and say you must apply to Duke Wellington in, in Washington? We end up with my late friend Vernon in Lesotho, uh -huh. uh, 1979. Uh, and Nakona, I was leaving, not because of political activity, because by Edgar Duhole, who was the DJ at Pelican, the main yeah. DJ, he was known as Barry White, he was a great singer and a killer DJ, mm. had gotten a new gig in Lesotho. A new club had opened there called the Big Apple. Yeah. So I me mean, and I, I was really aggressive. I, you know, I wanted to be where the next thing is because I've been at the Pelican for two years. And I mean, now you're 16 years old. Yeah. You're itchy. <laughs> yeah, I was a hey, big time itchy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, some of my friends who were hanging out at the club in the afternoon were activists, so they knew of a underground railroad to get to Lesotho. I mean, being humble, being humble. You were just going with the flow. We left the club, went to Morocco Police Station. Uh, before you know it, the, the highlight of that, that no one ever, ever heard before until now, is when we approached what's known as Caledon River. Yeah. They oh, must remember they organized. And I mean, I just heard that this side, there's a South African uh, uh, military. Yeah. Uh, and then this side, Basoto. Mm. The, 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 barricade, uh, the, the army that was guarding both sides. So now these guys are casual about, hey, one mistake, boom, a bullet on you. Now I mean, I mean, he's a sexy guy, you know. <laughs> and apparently, I touched the water and collapsed, so they carried me across to Lesotho. Because I heard this really traumatizing thing. With the, one bullet mistake, and you die. You know, a lot of people died trying to cross. So I crossed over and bang shiara. Yeah. And I walked until I saw a building. And that building, I've obviously later realized that it was the, what is the, the biggest tower in Lesotho, yeah. uh, Victoria Hotel. Yeah. So that's how I ended up in Lesotho, not knowing I'm in exile until that evening I hook up with Gary Hall. I'm like, 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 I
You I'm know? here. And wait, so did you ever meet up with your friends again? No, the same night I hang okay. out, hang out with my Edgar, and I end up working at a Big Apple. The mm. same crew that was at the Pelican that are now, are now there. political. In fact, that's where I got pretty much politicized. So this is where the U.S. ambassador then sees you perform. Then, yeah, then we have a different hustle with me and Vernon, oh. because at that time uh, there was a refugee stipend of thirty rands. Okay. But uh, now we're used to making some money, you know. Thirty, so 30 rands is just not going to yeah, cut it. So we we started. Uh, you know Victoria Hotel? Yes. Well, now I know it. The highlight of that, we started with restaurants. We would talk mm -hmm. to a five-star restaurant uh, manager. They put a piano on the side, and we start entertaining the guests. So we were like the Saturday, Sunday afternoon locosa. We opened the Victoria Hotel outside mm -hmm. Garden Court. Mm -hmm. Vernon would play piano, out sing, and play percussions. Is this where your aspirations... And that's how we made more money than refugee uh, status uh, stipend. stipend right now. Because I know you said in your in your mind you were going to be like Marvin Gaye, like Jackie Brown. Like this no, that's is, later. Is that's, that later? That's later because uh, now Ndadetim Tahani, who was friends with Venon's father, yeah. walked in, he was uh, based in Washington, D.C. as yeah. ambassador, walked in at one of these restaurants and we approached him. You know, anyone that came in, that's when I first met Ndate uh, Kafa Semenya. Uh, before the new dispensation. Yeah. So we, we kind of like hustled through with the ambassadors and you know what I mean? So we told Tate Tim Tahani that we want to go to America. Long story short, between uh, Tate Tahani, uh, an organization based in New York called TransAfrica, mm. and yes. years later I learned Mezan Ellenbeck signed my refugee passport in Lusaka. A special arrangement was made for us to be adopted and we ended up in Syracuse first initially and then years later ended up in D.C., Washington, D.C. So up until then, you had never studied music. You had just no. been in it. Yeah. And yeah. when you get to Washington, do you then start studying Washington, it? Washington, D.C., at Duke Ellington School of the Arts is where I formally got a sense of ah. studying, studying music ah. and where my dream of being the biggest R&B star literally died <laughs> because uh, my age group then were so talented better than the stars that I knew, you know. I mean, I went to, I sat in the same desk lane with Tony Terry, who became a superstar then. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people came from Duke Ellington School of the Duke Ellington, Duke Ellington was like the New York School of the Arts, yeah. the competitors. Yeah. So now, if you are from South Africa and you want to sing like Marvin Gaye, and in the choir of the school, there's four singers that sing better than Marvin Gaye. <laughs> but, well, You're never going to be Marvin yeah, Gaye. So, the first year and a half were these two Africans in this little corner, <laughs> Koskolo, right? until one day, we were just messing around doing what we used to do Back home. in Lesotho. Yeah. Just when I was on piano, and we're just messing around with anything. I remember actually the memory that we did was Ranza Ranza, baby, pa, da, da. and it was different. Two key things happened. The cutest girls pay attention to us. Okay, honey. Okay. And then the piano is surrounded, and the... Uh, um, school principal, Dr. Morris, said, stay there, that's where you are. And because we realized that we're getting attention, at that point, not consciously, mm. I started kind of researching South African music. Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, Mathatini, yeah. Huma Sikela, Mira Makeba, you know. The people who were <coughs> making it internationally by sticking yeah. to an, in an African farm. Song. Actually, I was doing it in farm because when people ask you what was that that you did, and you have no... All you knew is R&B. Yeah. So you had to kind of like have answers. So I had to do research and I got sucked into finding myself in that way because when you start talking about Lady Smith, Black Mambas, or Huma Sikela, Mira Makeba, that became more fascinating to the students. So we became hip basically. Mm. And mm. then there was a church in DC that adopted me uh, called the Union Temple Baptist Church. And I became part of the choir there. And I started experimenting with taking American, uh, American uh, gospel song, any, and I start throwing lines in South African. Kante, I was an arranger in training. Because I'm saying now, this is where you were getting the initial, the DNA of what then you went to go do with Hans Zimmer. Yeah, years later. Years I later. End, it ended up being my basis, the basis of my career. Sure. That's how the dollars came in. <laughs> so you are hearing from the man himself, Levu M. More when we get back, do not go anywhere. Trust me, it's going to get a little bit more riveting.
when celebrated film score composer Hans Zimmer agreed to create the soundtrack for Disney's 1994 animated sensation, The Lion King, he knew there was only one person he wanted to work with, and that one person is here. So I want to go to LA, right? And you are there washing cars and working at McDonald's to make ends meet. LA was hard initially. Uh, we finished, uh, well, long story short, I got dumped in the 12th grade in high school by my high school Sweet. girlfriend. Aww. And that's like before the Nancy got a nice prom. Prom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, being a refugee, after she dumped me, I went to where I was staying, took my plastic bag and left. Okay. I never did the prom. <laughs> you just like, forget your metric <laughs> dance. Forget your prom night. Metric dance. Prom prom king, yeah, I was gone. I was gone. Okay. We went to Syracuse. We were hustling in Syracuse. And we were promised uh, a huge break then <clears throat> by someone that had worked with Dr. Okay. as an arranger. I still have to find his name. Uh, and uh, Muntu Semenya, who was a very close friend of, I, of yeah. me and Vernon, we all were living together in Syracuse. Uh -huh. And he made the contact, and boom, we flew to L.A. One-way ticket, the whole nine yard. We went to L.A., met the guy, and a really nice conversation. At the end of it, he realized that our entire livelihood... Depended on him. Depended on him. Because, you know, Moshe, former, I now know that as a producer years later, he, he, you know, he's like, okay, so guys, the studio is in there, so I'll see you guys at the studio at 9 o'clock. And we look at each other, what is this talk about? We're here now. Forget studio, where are we going from here? <laughs> <laughs> where we're so sitting right one now. One way, one way. And he literally realized that and took us to South Central LA. He was so angry. He should have been angry at himself. In retrospect, now I know how this thing worked. But he, he had this old office mm -hmm. uh, that was in an apartment complex. You could tell it was never open for years. Oh. You know, bringing them a car parts, old furniture, and then this is this is like too big. The space was that m smaller than this. So we lived in the streets in LA from that point on, maybe two years before I even got my first job uh, in a car wash. Yeah. Uh, because we used to have to come sleep here in South Central LA and go downtown and penny pedal. Oh, so you used to beg in LA? Yeah, we slept in a bus, bus station for almost two years. Greyhound bus station. So if you didn't get enough cash to go back to this little room, yeah. you hang out at the bus station until the sun comes out. And then, you know, the first job people come in. Long story short, then I end up in LA. Um, uh, start hustling your way up. Um, uh, got married yeah. first time around. Wait a minute. <clears throat> How do you get married when you broke? Uh, no, Pella, there was a period where during this entire time, yeah. I had applied for a scholarship. Okay. Yeah, it was a bishop okay. to, to fund. Okay, I'm yeah? back. And that was collapsed by, I believe it was President Reagan mm. when it came in. So when the scholarship fund came in, a little change was there, you know, and I went to Los Angeles City College. Mm. So that's after that whole two and a half years of being in the streets and hustling. And when you're in the street hustling, is, is the dream still alive of being a singer that's gone? Or yeah. you you in composing? It's not anywhere alive. It's the only thing that keeps us alive. Oh, okay. Is, you know, and of course, long before we went to America, we already got politicized and we're part of the exile community. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, coming from that era to now, the difference in how we as black people lived uh, in poverty. We were more united in poverty. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Whether it's Lesotho, Los Angeles, London, New York, you basically knew how many South Africans were where. Yeah. So you know what? Okay, so and so and so, which told you, we'll be hungry together. Mafiga lapa, look for so and so. You know, so there was South African communities everywhere. Yeah. So you kind of tap into that eventually. Uh -huh. So when we went to Los Angeles City College, my entrance into the LA music scene actually starts in LA. Yeah. Because a friend of mine, Dale Atkins, who was a bass player and still is a bass player, had a studio at his house, uh, Google, not even his house at the back yeah. door. And we used to do demos there. And then every Thursday, there was uh, Mala's, Ma Mala Gibbs. Mala Gibbs was a big superstar yeah. on, uh, on TV. I can't even think of... Uh, the uh, TV show. Mm. She owned a jazz club in South Central, in Lemert Park. Lemert Park was like the culture mm. part of LA. So they used to have a talent night. 
So Bear, Dale Atkins was the bass player of the Talent Night. So I used to go there and hang out with them. And from there, you start getting gigs uh. to, to do TV commercials, radio stuff. Uh. And eventually that led to, I'm always trying to remember what is really the first break, the first key break uh, in my career. I went on a tour in 1988 with uh, a production that was called Bua, uh -huh. which was the first time exiled musicians uh, were in one production with... Uh, Got together. Inzals. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it was arranged and produced by Dr. Kafa Semenya, Letambulu, and all of it. So I was this little kid. I was the youngest there. So we did all of Africa for eight, eight months. And through that, I met Dr. Jonas Gwangwa, blah, 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 and then went to Los Angeles. There was a movie that was being done. Now, before, I'm not sure which comes first. I yeah. mean, you know, your research team has to do this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can let me. I'll see if I know myself. <laughs> uh, research team, my ears ready, eh? Cry of Freedom was nominated for, 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 for Oscar. an Oscar. And yeah. you did the choir for the Bra Oscar Yeah, but Gwanga was based in London. Uh -huh. I'm based in LA. I'm, done, I'm now the new kid that everybody calls for anything African. Uh. So because he was based in London, I end up putting together the uh, Cry Freedom segment choir. Uh -huh. and arranging it, and boom, that, uh, Bragwanwa didn't win, but we were the highlight of the Oscars. Yes, because you guys got a standing ovation. Yeah. Yes. We were the highlight of the Oscars. Then I got a call the next day from Joe Zawinul, uh -huh. who was the leader of a group called uh, Weather Report. Weather Report was the band. I did, uh, I co-wrote a song with uh, Joe Zawinul called uh, South Africa, yeah. and it wasn't a hit, but it's one of Joe Zawinul's classic songs. From there, I get a call. Uh, no, I didn't get a call. I became friends with Hilton Rosenthal, who was Johnny Clegg's producer, and he had a studio in Los Angeles. So I was an intern at Hilton's studio, making coffee, blah, blah, blah. And Hans Zimmer was friends with Hilton. Oh, so this is where yeah, you and Hans yeah. became. So Hans came because he had this other South African movie. I believe then he probably was looking to, to team up with Johnny, Johnny, but Johnny was not there. Hilton looked around and said, Hans, you should try this kid. So Hans said, yeah, yeah, come to my studio tomorrow, you know, to see if, if I'm doing the right chord here. I end up co-writing, performing all the lead vocals in Power of One, mm, encouraging yes. the film company to come to South Africa to redo the entire score. We booked Bob Studios, entire studio. In fact, Ringo Malindos was a session musician then, and I heard his voice. And I made him sing. I started. Ringo is the second voice that yeah. comes after me when Power One starts. And I said to him, You're a solo artist. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we finished Power One and went back to LA. And it wasn't a big movie, but the soundtrack was identified as one of the landmark soundtracks of that era. And that led to uh, me working now. Okay, we're going to take an, a break, but when we come back, I want to run through, because, I mean, you've, you've basically been, if not, if not won it, nominated, flirted around it, a Grammy, an Oscar, a Golden Globe, uh, a Tony, you know, and a lady, all of it. You, 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 are just, you are just one big accolade. I want to talk about this. I need more than coffee. <laughs> he says he needs more coffee. Cause <laughs> I, I'm mean, I, I need more than coffee. You need more than coffee. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's water. This is me. Now, because of me, he needs more than coffee. We'll be right back. <laughs>
In 2006, Lebu M realized his lifelong dream of bringing the Lion King stage production home to Africa, the true home of Mufasa, Rafiki, Simba, Nala, Timon, and Pumba. <laughs> now, you say, ah, you are not a, 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 a on stage person, you are behind the scenes, you are a producer, mm. but there's a childlike smile on your face mm. when you are on stage. Yeah. Do you realize? It just came back recently. Uh, in the last three, five years. Uh -huh. Because I started being like, that's a, that's a clip from Havasi. Uh -huh. Havasi is like one of the biggest concepts, concerts in, uh -huh. in, in Europe specifically. He's like the biggest thing in Budapest. So they called me in and as a guest, I did that. Then that after that, I, I did the first Hans Zimmer show, which was a test show in London in 2014. Yeah. Then I realized, man, this is my love. This is what I really like, like to do. You mm. know? <clears throat> Take you back to your Marvin Gaye days, like, yeah, I should yeah. be out there, <laughs> yeah, so the honeys yeah. can see, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, so I kept doing, you know, just bring the energy back and the confidence back. Now, yeah. we're ready for a full Lewem World Tour. It's just hard to, we can't do Lewem with seven piece band, you know, it has to be bigger, <laughs> oh, yeah, it has to be massive, yeah. It's hard because coming from the kind of projects that we've done, uh, me producing the Lion King in South Africa, which yeah. was a six and a half year business proposition Just, mm. it didn't like happen overnight mm. uh, brokering that deal was yo mm. yeah by the time we have opening night here uh, at theatro it was a monster I had wasn't the theatro built for mm. you for you no it was yeah. built to spec uh because the way the deal was done before the theatro we had done research né, to find a theater for the lion king and i got called in two three times at disney that listen doesn't make business sense. Mm. Uh, the kind of investment you're talking about, six and a half to seven million dollars, there's no theater that is built that can accommodate the Lion King. Mm. So I'd heard some friends <clears throat> were building a gym at uh, Teatro. Mm. No, where what? In, 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 in Monte, Monte Casino. Yeah, so I started having some meetings, ended up with Brajabu. Uh, Mabuza, who was MD then, yes, yes, uh, well. another really good friend of mine, uh, Moses, Ma Moses Tembe, and I convinced them, negotiated and brokered them to do away with building the gym, just added a couple of more million uh, and build the teatro and I'll open it with Lion King. Which is now easily <coughs> the best theater. Yeah, and then the teatro was built to spec to accommodate the Lion King, because you know, and when a theater is built for a production like the Lion King at that time, probably even now, the most technically advanced Broadway show in history. Yeah. It, it can do anything after the Lion King Did leaves. Mufasa fell off a cliff <laughs> in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, and, I was, yeah. and I was so worried when I went yeah. and I was like, I wonder how Mufasa is going to yeah. fall off the cliff. Yeah, so we broke it there, brought in uh, Telcom with, with a really reasonably friendly sponsor check that had never been done before. Uh, at about, I think about 25 million rand or so. Mm. And then broke at SABC. So we put together probably the biggest business package in the history of theater in all of Africa. And thankfully, it was a success across the board. Mm. And that production, uh, that's 10 years ago, set a new way of how to produce The Lion King worldwide. Mm. Because before I produced The Lion King South Africa, Disney and everybody else was not convinced that, that was, you can lucrative. have, <clears throat> no, not only lucrative, that South Africans can play other principal roles other than Rafiki. Because across be, yeah, the globe. Across now. the world, yeah. yeah. Because before that, we were casting and hiring South African singers and dancers. As as like the, the backline. Yeah, the, the backline but in front, yeah. you know. So I played the first uh, in the original show, I was uh, the antelope. There's I, that song that's yeah. the song coming through. <laughs> yeah. I was the <laughs> antelope, you know. But uh, thank God from that Lion King South Africa. We were able to now to expand to other characters. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Selma Kamube played Mufasa. made a mistake. He came to my audition as a Cheki Priam, <laughs> and then straight to audition, and then he's humming as we leave Kipis. He's just humming something. And I made everybody turn back, reset the table. Also, look, he said, What's up? I'm going to say, I'll hear that out here. I said, No, no, no. You're my next Mufasa. Aye. <laughs> Literally. I said, No, no, I don't sing. I don't think he was serious. And I auditioned him two weeks later. He went to London. He had just finished, what's that show? Generations. Mm. I think he went from Archie to Mufasa. <laughs> so I yeah. I and the then dresses. the first Simba from South Africa was Brian Temba. Uh. He was the first Simba in history. 
then from there it expanded to other characters. Uh, and now we're building the next Lion King from here. And now I know that, you know, at the very least, uh, 20 of the cast will be South African. Is that something you, you, you put in the contract? Is that something you negotiate and say, here, okay, I'm not willing to compromise? In fact, more than that, while we're mounting the Lion King in New York 21 years ago, because we are celebrating 20 years in November this year, the biggest challenge, I had to go to New York union meetings for about a year and a half Jeez. while we were rehearsing in Minneapolis. Mm. Uh, and when we got to New York, because the New York theatre rules are so strict, you had to convince the new union, the union why you have to have South Africans and not Americans mm. on the first cast of The Lion King. Mm. So I had to do myself, Julie Tamos, the director, and Tom Schumacher, the executive producer. We spent months while rehearsing The Lion King mm. going to convince the union. So South Africans for an American produced production who were South Africans left over from Sarafina that I hired were the first cast of The Lion King. 21 years ago. And that's because we managed to convince the New York Union that in order to keep the spirit that was the motivating factor for the success of the movie, yeah. it has to have a minimum, initially as well, a minimum nine South Africans in the 42 cast members, 42 or 40, whatever it is, it changes all the time. Yeah. And since then, we have grown from 12 to 14 and some other productions have 27 South Africans. So I hear you have auditions in South Africa. We have at least two, three auditions every year. For the last 20 years, we hire more South African unknown talent than anyone in history. At least a minimum of seven, eight, nine, ten people leave this country to go live mm. and work in foreign currency in London, Australia, mm. New York. And we have South African cast members that have been in New York since the beginning of the Lion King. So, I mean, which gets, brings me to your accolades <coughs> that you never stop to, to celebrate. And this is an observation from me. You can say, Anele, you're wrong. I sit and I, I, I pat myself on the back. But I mean, you know, there's an Oscar, there's a Grammy, there's a Golden Globe, there's a, there's a Tony nomination, there's an Aledi Award, which apparently you were too nervous to go and get. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the story we'll Coffee. go with. <laughs> no, uh, I, I won a Grammy for yeah. the ranking. I was nominated for a Tony. Okay. And two South African or three South African musical awards, mm. and in never an Oscar. I was nominated, Amazing. almost nominated for the Oscar, and it became political. We don't know how my name disappeared. It's but we sharp. So we told her next time. Yeah, it's <laughs> right, it's right. Yeah, it's but it's right. yes, the Lion King movie and the Broadway show collectively has probably the the, the largest uh, accolades. Yeah. yeah. So what's what's the closest? accolade to your to like you like something that you like you know what if i die tomorrow let that be the first thing they say when they speak about label m and you can include the fact that you are making sure that south africans are fed on broadway and west end around the world you can include that because i feel that's an accolade that's my it's, it's no longer an accolade it's the, it's the biggest reward to yeah. to know that my work and what we do not only gives people opportunity it changes lives yeah we've seen people let me let me try to describe the largest number of talent that we hire. Mm. It's not people, and actually, I'm, I'm saying a lot of, I almost said the other way, I'm saying a lot of stuff I never said before. Yeah. When we started the Lion King auditions here, obviously you get the industry uh, talent, yeah. you know, agents. Okonomunyu uh, sisi wang dina, wabat divarish, that time, yeah. Yeah. plus being Sasha, yeah, so, I got annoyed and I shut out the auditions. And I remember saying, you know, let's just do open calls. That was the greatest by default how to audition for The Lion King. Yeah. Because we realized that the largest number of talent are people who've never sung mm. in a wedding, in a funeral, and we, we discovered raw talent. So for the largest part, because we hire from 18 onwards, mm. the people that will come are people who just picked up a, a, a pamphlet. Mm. Was with Tati Shans. And we hired that large number of people and, and sent them overseas. And some of them come back here and become stars. Every time I turn the TV on, I that person has worked with us. This person has worked with us. This one has been in Lion King. Lona Uzo Mtian and Fagagu Tazan and Fagagu Hanzema, O Silomake, and a lot of talent. So we, it's rewarding to know that uh, in the last 20 years we've contributed. Uh, financially and otherwise to building families.
Okay, don't go away. After the break, we conclude our chat with Lebu M about his epic musical journey in film, TV and the theatre that has brought him worldwide critical acclaim. And also, I want to talk about Lebu M, the father. Huh? The father. Time show flies when you're having fun. Welcome to the final segment of the show with our guest, Lebu M. Now, here is the thing. All of this thing you've been telling us, mm -hmm. from when we started to now, you never once mentioned your father or your mother. Yet, you've got such a strong sense of being a parent. Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? It comes both from my parents, but mostly my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, uh, she's 89 years old from a building, uh, Eastern Cape, and they hooked up in Joburg many years ago. Mm. And she's my pillar, yeah? And both my parents now live in my house mm. uh, because they need help. Uh, and most of the years when I was in exile, in fact, my mother had come at least two or three times to come visit me in Lesotho. Mm -hmm. yeah, so then I have that and I'm very lucky, very blessed. In fact, I almost forgot, the highlight of my career mm. is this last tour going around the world with my daughter, Rafi, who's 23, mm -hmm. who had gone up and down everywhere. And I've been watching her, watching her. She's like my Missy Elliott. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think I'm blessed to know that if Utiklo checks me out, I have a child that's actually probably more talented than me. Whoa. Because she stepped in the shoes uh, uh, Zoe Mtian was my first guest in the Zima tour. Mm. She did the first tour. And then I brought in Mbuyi, uh, who's our Rafiki. You're talking about people that are experienced on stage. Mm. Buyi had been our main Rafiki around the world. And I made a decision, having watched my daughter perform in some little place in Durban uh, long time ago. And I made a call. I said, you're coming on a tour with me. So this entire five months, I've been on stage with my daughter. Mm in the biggest venues you can ever dream of, and she was on fire, mm. you know? So that's the highlight of my career. And my, uh, my son is in school in Los Angeles at the MI Music Institute. He wants to do music also, he wants to learn the producing, but I like the fact that he's focused on learning the business. Yeah. Um, and then my daughter's in Virginia, my firstborn, studying theater, mm. and my little ones. Oh, and so you, you got the sense of like, because you're very present as a father, right? You got mm. that from your dad. It's something that you saw him do and you're like, that's how I'm going to be when I'm a parent. To the contrary, no. My dad was a different kind of dad. Oh. My dad was my role model. Duty. I don't want to be like him oh. type of thing. Uh, so he inspired me to uh, look at life differently. Okay. And I think fortunately growing up in exile, I was able to, you know, when, when, I, when you get to in the presence of people like Quincy Jones, Kaifa Semenya, Obama, so next door, yeah, uh, yeah. you shape yourself away from, he's still the center of my life because he was a musician between my mother and my father, great singer, but I grew up in a very difficult uh, environment, mm. home environment. Mm. Yeah, that's why the difference between my, my mother and my father is that my mother became the, the center uh, and the spiritual and all of that. So now, having grown up like that, you have this natural instinct that I will do my best to be the best father that mm. will ever be. Of course, there's been trial and tribulation. I've been married three times. Why not do people six. think it's seven? Huh? No, I, I, in the same sense, you know. I, the, the, the so it's official, you've been married no, three times? No, uh, yeah, this, I can say that. Nandi, Ndlovu, uh, Viveka, and Angela. Okay. Yeah. You remarried Angela, though? Yeah, we uh, no, didn't remarry. You didn't divorce? No. We got divorced uh. and we tried to get back together. Uh. And I wanted to do something formal because she was coming back into my life with okay. children. And I said, you know what, because we are so, my divorce with Angela and everybody else was so overexposed, I don't want, especially because my parents are older now and the children are older, uh. I wanted to formalize. It's like, I, I gotta find a way. There must be a ceremony. Yeah, a ceremony of sort. And I happened to have been going to Egypt. On business. That's where you did the, yeah. the redo the vows. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a, a renewal of love, oh. and a renewal of the relationship because I felt very strongly 
that because her children are older mm -hmm. and my children are younger and we're family and we're overexposed, I don't want the kids to come back to my house and they keep it again. Ah. You understand? So it was very important to me. So it was arranged very quickly that no, do something. Now what happened is the the the, <laughs> the company that we hired to do the ceremony. I wanted to be killer because Milan Sasem Nan and we look seen. I don't know how to do small things. No, no, no. You Everything know? is an event. Yeah, it has to be an event. But when they printed the, the program it was a renewal of the marriage vow. But it's cool. Me and her knew that it doesn't matter. Yeah, unfortunately, ultimately it didn't work out, but there was never a marriage at all. Okay, so we've got one minute. I'm gonna ask you this. Now we're done. Are you are you, are you a <laughs> difficult person to be in a relationship with? No, I don't believe so. In fact I'm the opposite. I'm not a blesser, I'm a builder. Oh. So oh. I need a co builder. Mm-hmm. So you don't want someone who you're going to have to push to be independent and push to make money. They I need to push, come. I push. I support my friends and my partners. Yeah. I, I mean, the, 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 the ladies that I've been blessed to have children with, I'm very proud of the fact that I've, I've really done my best mm. to, to, to let them be. You know, uh, my, my last, the mother of my last born, I hired her for the Lion King year, yeah. took her to Australia, came back here. I literally... When I was asked to do Tarzan, my last soundtrack, I was in Cape Town. I literally put her in the studio, put her voice in Tarzan, co-produced the song and co-wrote the song, but it was important to me that I put in Tarzan for the rest of her career after she had done Hans Zimmer tour with me. You know? And the previous one, it was in Jalo, listen to. So, Tina, so you're not a blesser, you're a builder? No, nah, I'm not a blesser, I'm a builder. I can't afford to bless, man. Okay, there we go. Builder's Warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you can call him when you see him on the streets. Yeah. What a journey and absolute yeah. pleasure to have shared this hour with Label M. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all we have time for. This could have carried on for two hours, to be fair, but sadly, it's only an hour. For Master Real Talk Team, it's a good night. We'll check you next time.